if you search for the terms both trans and left-handed on Twitter, you get a lot of matches and in particular a lot of that one, these two graphs basically appear over and over again. And in part, apparently, that was because this guy, Ari Drennan, first did a tweet and then did a follow-up video called The Left-Handed Epidemic Gripping America. Earlier this year, I had a tweet go somewhat viral in the way where I heard from a lot of old friends. I pointed out in response to someone's concern about the rising number of youth who identify as trans, that in shockingly recent history, all children were also forced to write with their right hand. That when that practice ended, the number of left-handed children increased by nearly a thousand percent. Dude, this is not a 1000% increase. You have gone from 3% to 12%. That's maybe a 400% increase if you're being generous. In 1932, just 2% of people in the United States wrote with their left hand. Also, at no point does this line get to 2%. 2% of people. And the closest it ever does is at what appears to be 1907. 1932. 1932 would be around this area of the graph where 8% of people were left-handed. So that's not to put the blame on Critfax specifically. This is a piece of misinformation, I guess, that has become quite popular in the trans community. It's been promoted by, as you've seen, hundreds, thousands potentially of people. And there's this staunch insistence that you know, this is based in science, but they don't actually really give a shit about what the data is saying. On a gathering storm comes a non-passing man in a shiny white coat with a trans left hand. trans left hand so the conversation that ensued from the tweet that I uh, made the video about the other day has been pretty funny I definitely want to do a video which is like crit facts and friends but just the and friends and basically compile all the other people that just got involved in the conversation as well I think it'll be educational to look at them as a collective. So in part of the discussion, the smart thing to do here would be to show the tweet, but I'm just going to try and remember it off the top of my head. So I made the quote, which was basically about how creepy all the most prominent queer theorists are in regards to either having abused children, had sex with minors, or advocated some form of uh, CSA. So the first wave of <laughs> um, irate lunatics are like, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. So there's a significant amount of time spent just like copying, pasting quotes until they inevitably stop talking. And then the discussion moves from okay, so we can't deny that they've said these things. Now we say, well, that doesn't have any impact on queer theory. And we make comparisons to other ideologies that people accept that also have questionable heritages, lineages or whatever it is. The thing normally with that is that they'll only be able to find one. Like they'll say Freud was, was whatever the fuck Freud was, but we still do some Freud shit. And the counter is essentially, yeah, but that's just one Freud you dudes have like six or seven Freuds <laughs> you have a lineage you have a progression of Freuds that all keep saying not different problematic stuff 
all the same creepy shit. Yeah, like if you had a Mount Rushmore, all those people should probably be in jail. So then, they'll also deny queer theory is a thing. So often when I debate them, they delete their comments. So I've like had to start trying to screen cap everything. And yeah, someone said queer theory isn't a thing and like 20, well, this is like 16 people liked it. <laughs> I remember specifically. And they're all like, yeah, yeah, queer theory isn't a thing. And then I just posted the Wikipedia post for queer theory. And then suddenly that person deleted their tweet and I couldn't see it anymore. And they all, effortlessly shifted from saying queer theory wasn't a thing at all to oh yeah of course it's a thing but blah 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 so now they admit it's a thing they admit its leadership have said a whole bunch of said and done a whole bunch of heinous shit the only place left they have is to say that the fact that that happened doesn't influence whether or not they were good ideas or not. Like, there's no link between that and their ideas, which was a similar thing that um, Empanada said about Foucault. Oh, Lord, it really brings me down about the devil town. Turf Empanada. We have to start calling him Turf Empanada, so he has to deny that he's a turf, because then when he tries to deny it we say well what did you say about Foucault and then he gets trapped oh, I can't wait for that to happen but anyway once they've admitted that it's a thing and all the other bad shit the one thing they say is you can't make the link between that stuff and the ideology and one of the most clear ways to make the link between what they've been saying for decades between child sexual abuse and pediatric transition is that they're basically exactly the same thing I did something diabolical. I did something diabolical. I learned everything about circumcision. I know everything about it, and I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Buckle up, because it's going to be a bumpy fucking ride. Circumcision lies where surgery, sex, religion meet. It's a powerful, compelling topic. Most of the world is not circumcised. Europeans have never practiced circumcision. It's lunacy. It definitely affects sensation. Major claims require major proof. When you make a major claim that we doctors can improve upon the human body by removing organs, you've got to show me major proof. And anyway, one of the points that he gets to is about the connection between circumcision as a ritual and human sacrifice <laughs> and circumcision and how it's like kind of a faux human sacrifice and in particular he talks about how up until quite recently and i had heard this previously that um they would actually uh use their fingernails to do the circumcising like this way you would you know maybe snap if you're like trying to cut your kid's fingernails you bite it or whatever they would use fingernails and they'd suck the blood which is pretty gross and like you know fucking stds would be transmitted via that these seem like extreme acts of sexual violence to you that is because they are and they have real consequences here we have a baby who has contracted herpes after Moyle has performed Metsitsa on him. Now this baby is effectively brain dead for the rest of his life because this Moyle was satisfying an ancient act of rabbinic revenge. This article is from 2017, guys. This is not ancient history. This was all interesting to me because I've always seen a relationship between circumcision and gender affirmation surgery. Although John Money was pretty good at manipulating social anxieties to his own ends, even without this talent and fraud, as far as the broader society was concerned, intersex babies were, let's say, not a nice neighborhood, and Dr. John Money was an exciting new developer. Using progressive rhetoric, he pioneered a new form of neoliberal eugenics as he set about gentrifying a newly discovered population for the capitalist patriarchy. In the name affirmation, it shows that these are both religious processes. They're a form of ritual cutting where, where we agree socially, oh, after this certain type of cutting, then they're transformed from like this type of person to this type of person. But that's like a social agreement. There's no actual biology to any of that. The purpose of doing it is the ritual of doing it. And I've also recently found sources that talk about the connection between class society 
and human sacrifice, which I'd never really thought about before. So this is from the Washington Post, and it says the quote, darker link, end quote, between ancient human sacrifice and our modern world. And basically it talks about the role that human sacrifice has played. And one of the things it says is that one of the main forms of early human sacrifice was to be buried, you know, the same way like slaves in Egypt would get buried along with the king or whatever. So that shows a direct correlation between human sacrifice and class society, the idea of like people as property, that once the person who owned you was done owning you, you stopped existing. Um, and also that this played a role in stratifying society, that the more human sacrifice you had, the more it divided the society into classes. So. The story begins 12,000 years ago. Sigmund Freud surmised that circumcision started as a step down from child sacrifice. So instead of sacrificing the child, you would just sacrifice an essential part of him, his genitals. Now these genital blood sacrifices eventually lessened until just parts of his genitals were sacrificed, his foreskin. Now many people erroneously believe, <laughs> if you can believe it, many people erroneously believe something. But many people erroneously believe that circumcision started in the Old Testament, the Jewish holy book. Actually, Judaism adopted circumcision from tribes circumcising in the area. But if we take a look at the Holy Covenant in Genesis, we can see what it has to say. Every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Whether born or bought with your money or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. And the eighth and final rule. This is your first night at Fight Club. You have to fight. Any uncircumcised male will be cut off from his people. Now, a couple things to notice here. Every baby must be circumcised, and slaves too, because that was cool at the time. And if you weren't, and if you weren't, you were cut off from your people, which was tantamount to a death sentence in ancient times. Now, Leonard Glick, who is a Jewish man with a medical degree and a PhD in cultural anthropology with a specialty in genital cutting. We gotta get his balls. It's useless to fight. It's really a powerful gesture, Mr. Durden. Assures me that this is not even the original covenant. It was appended to the Bible in 500 BC for two reasons. Now, the first reason is the child is circumcised when he is a baby, so he has absolutely no choice in the matter. This forever forces him to look Jewish. Now this promotes tribal cohesiveness, a primary objective of all tribal leaders, as they have a vested interest to maintain the social order of the tribe as they enjoy their status at the top of it. Now, the second reason is a little more interesting and plays to the underlying psychology behind genital cutting cultures. But let's use a modern day example, fraternity hazing. Right, if the applicant is young, tell me he's too young. Old, too old, fat, too fat. Don't you look at me. Do you think you're ever getting in this house? You're never getting in this fucking house. Never. Get the fuck off my porch. Get off my porch! Fraternity hazing. This is the second in my series of videos on modes of production. In the first one, I dealt with the Neolithic Revolution. The transition to agriculture. Or to horticulture, at least. In the second one, I'm dealing with the beginnings of the transition to class society and the rise of patriarchy. Now, according to historical materialism, there's a relationship between economic surplus and class. The Hovertrack home Exer bike, or the Yohanneshav sofa with the string green stripe pattern, even the Rizlampa wire lamps of environmentally friendly unbleached paper. I'd flip through catalogs and wonder what kind of dining set defines me as a person. A precondition for the formation of classes in a society is that there's got to be a food surplus. But this is not enough by itself to create classes. A food surplus by itself might just extend the division of labour, allow some people to specialise in, in non-agricultural work, some of them to be potters, some to be smiths, etc. And a society with farmers, smiths and potters is not as such a class society, even if the trades become hereditary since the relationship between the trades would still be one of equals. There wouldn't be any exploitation at that point. Class formation requires more than this. 
it requires that at least part of the food surplus goes to support a group of people who are no longer engaged in physical production. And this non-productive status has to be something that is inherited and passed down through the generations. Now, in addition to consuming more food, the upper classes had a disproportionate share of other goods, clothes, jewellery, utensils, ornaments, etc. So the surplus they consume is not just a su food surplus. It's a general surplus. It's a surplus of the general labour product. And food surplus is just a precondition for this general surplus existing. it, Because if there wasn't a food surplus, there'd be no food for, for craftsmen. And if only enough cloth was produced to clothe the working population, then the rulers would go naked. If emperors have got clothes, there must be a food surplus. If kings are shodden, there must be a leather surplus. So that surplus moves beyond just being a matter of food and becomes a surplus of other products as well. One can look at this diagrammatically. Start off with a subsistence food economy where everyone grows the food they need themselves. The formation of a food surplus starts to allow craft workers. And as the food surplus gets bigger, you can have more craft surplus, more craft workers, and some of the food is going to the craft workers. Some of the food now goes to a non-labouring class, and they then consume part of the output of the craft workers. But that by itself isn't enough. Lots of things are needed. A class society requires a surplus, but the reverse isn't necessarily the case. A food surplus doesn't necess necessitate an exploiting class. To do that, you need other misfortunes. You need war, patriarchy and religion. The sequence is population expands and uses up free land. You then get conflict over resources, and this gives rise to the warrior role. In small communities, this means raiding, raping and capturing women. From this arises the patriarchy and the subordination of women. And from it also arises the capture of men to work as slaves. So that you get the transition from an initially egalitarian society to a patriarchal slave economy as the next stage. Now there are laws of statistics behind this. And it's to do with how community size affects its reproduction. You have to realise that in any community, the basic reproductive resource are the young women in the community. The rest of the community doesn't contribute to its reproductive capacity. And in small communities, typical of the stage when some agriculture or horticulture exists, but not enough of the protein sources are coming from that, there's still some hunting for protein, and hunting tends to maintain a low um, population density so that these agricultural settlements are widely separated and relatively small in number. Under these circumstances the number of young women in a community fluctuates for statistical reasons. I've drawn some graphs here of this is the expected number of girls in the next generation if you have a community of 20 families. I'm, I'm taking the number of women in the previous generation as the number of families. Um, this is the probability distribution if you have eight families. And basically this is a cumulative binomial distribution. I'm assuming that each woman has two children surviving to adulthood. Now, what these graphs tell you is if you project up, you can see what the probability of a shortfall is. So suppose we take a community of eight families they would end up with fewer than six young women in the next generation about a quarter of the time. But a shortfall of four women in a, this small community imply, that is to say, a ratio of six women to um, ten men in the next generation implies a shrinkage of the population by a quarter, which would threaten the survival of the, the, the community. So the actual survival of these small communities requires some mechanism to exist whereby women can be brought into that village. Communities with randomly low 
numbers of girls will have a strong pressure to get girls to migrate from neighbouring communities for them to survive. And we know historically this took two forms. The first was rape or capture of women, with the word rape in its original Latin sense meaning seizure, and the other was the purchase of brides in exchange for cattle. And that, of course, it wasn't possible in the areas where cattle hadn't been domesticated. And the net effect of this, either of those mechanisms, is to impose a transition from matrilocality, which was characteristic of hunting and gathering societies and the first stages of the Neolithic transition, to patrilocal societies, where successive generations live in the household of the male ancestor. Now, if we take the case of capture, the captured brides are going to be initially subordinate to the matriarch or mother-in-law and then become subordinate to their husband. They're subordinate to the matriarch because they're not her daughters, they've been brought in by the sons of the village. And this undermines the general principle of equality of the sexes in the society. And the principle of capture also undermines equality within the community because the captured wives are a subordinate group and as such it prepares the cultural conditions for the capture of slaves. Now if instead of the wives coming in by warlike capture there is an exchange of cattle between the communities that the village which gives up part of its reproductive potential is compensated by the receipt of cattle. What happens then is that the community that buys brides in exchange for cattle enters into a contract to the effect that the children of the bride that comes into the community will be members of her new tribe, not her original tribe. That has to be the case because that is the motivation for bringing in the brides. And this undermines matrilineal descent. Since those children are no longer the children of her own mother's tribe. They become children of a tribe different from their mother, or lineage group different from their mother. At the same time, the actual purchase of women provides the general cultural background for the purchase of slaves, and it establishes the idea that people can be property. A times B times C equals X. If X is less than the cost of a recall, we don't do one. And it establishes the practice of, for instance, blood money. Compensation of one tribe for another in terms of cattle if one person is killed. So what we see here is a contradiction. The initially egalitarian matrilineal society, once it transitions to settled agriculture, generates internal contradictions that nullify its initial conditions of existence. And this is a general feature of the transitions between social forms. The combination of the society and its mode of existence in the environment generates in time contradictions which lead to the abolition of that social form. Now, how can it be resolved? The basic uh, contradiction associated with small matrilineal communities could have been solved two ways. They could have become more exclusively agricultural or piscatorial whilst growing in size, so that it's possible to form big matrilineal or even matriarchal communities that don't suffer from this frequent random shortages of women of childbearing age. Larger communities like Katalhoyuk in Anatolia would not have suffered from these fluctuations in sex numbers. And this may be a reason why they were able to maintain an apparently egalitarian matriarchal structure for many thousands of years. The alternative path is to move towards a patrilineal and subsequently patriarchal form of family and clan structure. And we know empirically that in most cases, path two was more common. Now, at the same time as patriarchy and hierarchy and domestic slavery were um, developing, you get the rise of vengeful gods, belief in vengeful gods. And the early stages of class, sacri class society are marked by the most brutal forms of religion, with human sacrifice as the most terror inducing form of religion. Studies in, in a paper in, in Nature I'm citing, um, a statistical study of 93 different types of human cultures from anthropological records showed that 43% of these cultures 
carried out human sacrifice. Now, only a quarter of the egalitarian societies carried out human sacrifice. Uh, whereas 67% of the highly stratified societies carried out human sacrifice. I was a recall coordinator. My job was to apply the formula. Here's where the infant went through the windshield. Three points. A new car built by my company leaves somewhere traveling at 60 miles per hour. The rear differential locks Three. up. The car crashes and burns with everyone trapped inside. Now, take the number of vehicles in the field, A, multiply it by the probable rate of failure, B, then multiply the result by the average out-of-court settlement, C, A times B times C equals X. If X is less than the cost of a recall, we don't do one. Are there a lot of these kinds of accidents? You wouldn't believe. Uh, which gender clinic did you say you worked for? A major one. And it establishes the idea that people can be property. Right? So the point is this. Whatever we do to survive creates culture. If you have a fishing village, there's going to be a bunch of fishing songs. But basically, it's all about the, like, Tyler's kiss scene where uh, Tyler kisses the back of the guy's hand and puts whatever chemical on it to make it burn. But I just can't help but wonder why so many people buy it. And also, it just strikes me as, it strikes me as painful. Like the idea of having to get an injection every month or however often you're, you're supposed to get the hormone injections. It's just like, oh my God, why? Or, um, you know, surgery, like surgery after surgery after surgery after surgery. Um, that sounds like hell to me. But I know that when uh, various people who've made successful transitions talk about it, um, other kids don't, they're not focused on the pain. They're focused on the fantasy of, you know, Illusion, having sure. this part. Now, ancient peoples found their clothes got clean when they washed them at a certain point in the river. Do you know why? No. Because human sacrifice was once made on the hills above this river. Bodies burned, water seeped through the wood and ashes to create lye. This is lye, the crucial ingredient. Once it mixed with the melted fat of the bodies, a thick white soapy discharge crept into the river. Can I see your hand? What is this? This is a chemical burn. Ah! Ah! It'll hurt more than you've ever been burned, and you will have a scar. What are you doing? It strikes me as painful. Stay with the pain, don't shut this out. No, no, no! first gets his hand burnt, he's saying, I'm gonna go to my cave, I'm gonna find my power animal. It's right here! I'm going to my cave. I'm going to my cave, I'm gonna find my power animal. I think that's a reference to pre-agricultural religions, and I think the concept of a cave here is also meant to be reminiscent of hunter-gatherer society, of um, worshipping nature religions, and then Tyler's self-help group is the kind of authoritarian Abrahamic tradition. No! Don't deal with it the way those dead people do! He's basically saying, oh, you can run back to God if you want and try and pour water over it, but that's just going to make it worse. Or you can have access to this special knowledge that I have, essentially, uh, and that will fix your hand. The adolescent girls currently identifying as transgender, they don't want to pass, not really. They typically reject the boy-girl dichotomy. They make little effort to adopt the stereotypical habits of men. They rarely buy a weight set, watch football, or ogle girls. Ah, self-improvement is masturbation. No self-destruction. If they cover themselves with tattoos, they prefer feminine ones, flowers or cartoon animals the kind that mark them as something besides stereotypically male. They want to be seen as queer, definitely not as cis men. They flee womanhood like a house on fire, their minds fixed on escape, not on any particular destination. If someone come to the field Negro and said, let's separate, let's run, he didn't say, where are we going? He said, any place is better than here. not on any particular destination. And progress, oh yeah. Look at your hand. The first soap was made from the ashes of heroes, like the first monkey shot into space, without pain. 
It strikes me as painful. Without pain, without sacrifice, we would have nothing. And so he's now, in a lot of the other parts of the movie, he's advocating this like, oh, I want to go back to hunter-gatherer living, which is seen as valuable because it's authentic and real and in the present, whereas everything in this guy's life is um, distant and fake and- Copy of a copy of a copy. But at this point, he really is kind of like making the, the fascist kind of progress argument. And he's like, it's all about human sacrifice. He's like, this is where soap comes from. Soap, the yardstick of civilization. Literal human sacrifices. And that's why we need to continue to do this. And in a sense, the burning of the back of his hand is kind of like a circumcision in that it's like, he's like, this will hurt worse than you've ever been hurt before. And it'll leave a scar. To wrap up censored fact number one, it is irrefutably true that rabbis design and implement a circumcision to damage Jewish children's sexuality. Now this is a fact. It is an irrefutable fact. There are tombs of evidence to support this. Yes, it was done to mark us like cattle and to emasculate us like slaves and as an act of submission to your father, but to damage our sexuality in the most fundamental of ways for life was also a primary objective. What is that? It's nothing. Don't worry about it. Oh my god. Who did this? A person. Guy or girl? What do you care if it's a guy or a girl? What do you care if I ask? This is none of your business. You're Leave me alone. To say. I am not afraid no. to say, let me no. go. It's in keeping with the general hazing type way that Project Mayhem and Tyler recruit people, where there's a sense that people have when they have sacrificed that whatever they did must have been worth it because they sacrificed for it. So people will be less likely to leave something they've sacrificed to get into, even if it's just as without merit as, you know, something that's been given to them for free. It's a great opportunity and you're walking away from it. Look, shouldn't you at least try the job before you say no? Waste everyone's time, including my own? Kim, I appreciate your concern, but it's not for me. I don't want it. Jimmy, do you remember how long you studied for that bar? How hard you were? All that effort. You just gonna toss it away? That's the sunk cost fallacy. Wait, the what? The fallacy of sunk cost. It's what gamblers do. They throw good money after bad, thinking they can turn their luck around. It's like, I've already spent this much money or time or whatever. I gotta keep going. So there's a whole lot to digest there. And, you know, I'm sure lots of things people agree and disagree with, but I thought it would be valuable because it's a new way into broaching the topic of what is appropriate cosmetic surgery. Um, like, I don't have strong views about UBI or what he calls the freedom dividend, thousand dollars a month. I don't know what I think about that. He's yeah. like against circumcision. He has like all these views about things. Yeah. I don't really know if I agree with him on most of his things. Against circumcision? You don't agree with that? Uh, no. Really? Yeah. No, You're I'm cutting not, baby dicks. I'm not like passionate about that. Are well, you? Yeah. People lose their dicks. A lot of kids every year. Do you know children die from that? They children lose their die. dicks. Yes, all the time. It's very common. Really? Yes. Like multiple children per year lose their penis from an unnecessary, antiquated operation where you cut off their dicks to make it look different. What did you think was going to happen? Okay. You're cutting skin off of their dick, and they wind up getting infected, and they lose their dicks. It's, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, uh -huh. but it happens enough time where you go, well, this should never happen. He's a man, and he's dead now because of us, all right? Do you understand that? This is a completely unnecessary operation. Robert Baker oh, estimates like 229 a... deaths per year from circumcision in the United States. Bollinger estimates that apparently approximately 119 infant boys die from circumcision-related each year. In the U.S., 1.3% of all male neonatal deaths from all causes, there are several case reports of death in the medical literature. Yeah, this, it's not simple. You're cutting skin. Skin is an organ. You're, you, you have an unnecessary, I'm circumcised. You have an unnecessary operation that you're doing to an infant, and it's decorative. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a joke about and it. And you like, don't buy any of the studies about how it prevents STDs? and. No, no, I don't. Wash okay. your dick. <laughs> I cannot believe we're talking about this. We should be talking about it. Well, why not? Kids are dying. Like, it's like, how many of them have to die before we say this is a ancient, ridiculous ritual? It doesn't make any sense. Okay.
I, I've I, seen the arguments for and against, like that it prevents STDs. Like, look, you know what pre prevents STDs? Condoms and abstinence. Mm -hmm. That's what prevents STDs. And, and in some cases, vaccinations. This is what prevents STDs. This circumcision is ridiculous. It doesn't even make any sense. Okay. Cannot believe I stumbled into this because I was talking about Andrew Yang. You fucked up. I guess I did. <laughs> I didn't know this was like a strongly held. You're an intactivist. Is that what they're yes, called? Yes. Whatever. Intactivist. That's a good way of mm -hmm. putting it. I've never heard that expression, but that's exactly yes. what I am. Yeah. Don't cut baby dicks. It's real simple. When you say it that way, people go, yeah, that sounds gross. When you say, <laughs> oh, circumcision, like, oh, mm. what a wonderful ritual. And it's a it's symbolic of your journey until like, get the fuck out of here. You're cutting baby dicks. <laughs> dicks it's it doesn't make any sense as i've said before before if you were crazy enough to want to hack up the genitals or like cut the breasts off a teenager you had to become a serial killer now you can order that at mcdonald's if anything mcdonald's is subservient to trans at this point if mcdonald's went turf mcdonald's would <laughs> i don't know they could turn the tide potentially ronald and jk although if we're trying to make a distinction between the between the abusive deviants of queer theory then we might not want to put a clown as our mascot so anyway at some point pritfax said it's literally a patient driven decision but before we get to the rest of that quote i just want to address this bit here where he says like you do know blockers aren't transition right well tell that to jazz jennings because as a result of the medication jazz jennings was put on jazz's penis didn't grow properly and as a result, not only was it basically useless as a penis, it didn't even provide the surgeons with enough raw material to make a faux vagina out of. So while blockers may not be transition per se, they can definitely irreversibly fuck up the sexual function of the organs that you currently have. With risks laid out as clear as possible, as with every other medical procedure for kids. To which I said, it doesn't change the fact that the child is still incapable of informed consent. You can explain a tattoo to a 16 year old, they still can't get one. To which Critfax said, name a condition where lack of a tattoo causes major and persistent distress and then the two cases can be considered comparable. And so this is where I wanted to begin the video. It appears as though you are misusing the word cause. It is a mistake to believe that if it is the case that transition alleviates distress, then it can therefore be said that a so-called lack of transition is therefore causing said distress. This is not at all logical. Almost by definition, the lack of a cure cannot be said to be the cause of an ailment. Using that same reasoning, one could say that a lack of a plaster cast caused a broken arm, or a lack of paracetamol caused someone to have a headache. Remember, lobotomies were also often carried out in part to relieve distress, but no one would say that a lack of a lobotomy causes distress, despite the fact that it's undeniable that people are typically much more calm after they have been lobotomized. Also, in the case of young people with body dysphoria, the distress may often be related to being either homosexual or autistic. Many people who are homosexual and or autistic do not realize that this is the case until well after puberty. Hey everyone, it's me, Ben, or GNC-centric, and today I'm going to do a video about how I, a lesbian, believed for many years that I was a gay trans man. Okay, so the very first thing to understand is that I learned about gay homosexuality between males before I joined the queer community. So for them, I understood that it was a male and a male. Then I joined the queer community, then I learned what lesbians were. And I learned that lesbians were someone who identifies as a woman who is attracted to other people who identify as women. So everything got gendered instead of sex-based, right? Um, so if you haven't caught on, all of this 
is like based on internalized lesbophobia. I will explain. So I hated my female body. I hated all female bodies. Anything to do with like female experience of sexuality was like out of my mind and like irrelevant to me. Um, the concept of like lesbians was like always out of my mind. It was something I couldn't even think about. It was something that was like irrelevant to me, um, which I recognize now is just denial. So the concept of like being with a man is inevitable is like, it's part of compulsory heterosexuality. I'm gonna put a link um, to Adrian Rich, Rich is essay compulsory heterosexuality. So yeah, despite like feeling that I was supposed to be with a man, um, I changed it from a straight man to a gay man because then that took out the like heterosexual possibility of babies. Like not literally, of course, if, if it was possible, I could have gotten pregnant or something if I had actually like done that. But like in my mind, I was like with two gay men, the whole thing of like being a mother is like not even there. So I don't have to worry about that, which again is like another way that I was in denial of my femalehood. I think that this was just like my mind finding ways like very slowly over time to cope and make a situation where I was with a man sexually a survivable situation. Yeah. So I think that what I just described is not unique because I'm gonna put a link to a Twitter thread or two in the bio here, I mean in the description. Um, because I know like at least six lesbians who are detransitioned or re-identified who used to believe or live or act that like they were gay trans men because they believe they were. And then, like, after detransitioning or re-identifying, or um, they realized they were homosexual females, or they realized they were homosexual females and that's why they detransitioned. That was kind of what happened with me. And I think that there is a significant number of trans-identified females right now who are in relationships with men, who are on Grindr, who are having sex with men, who their entire relationship is based on dissociation. Their entire sexuality is based on dissociation. Um, it's extremely unhealthy and I worry a lot about them. Like, I know some people are gonna find this offensive, but I think there's a lot of trans-identified females who are actually lesbians who have so much internalized lesbopho um, lesbophobia that they've gone from like I'm a female who's attracted to females, even if it's like in the back of their mind something that they can't acknowledge, to the very opposite end as far as they could go to I'm a male who likes males. As far as you can get from lesbians is gay men, right? As far as you can get from ever interacting with another female body is being a gay man, right? Um, and also like gay men, there's like a bit of a like we hate female bodies, vaginas are gross, that kind of thing. Like, when you hang out with gay men and you already hate your female body, they're, like, reinforcing your dysphoria and you feel like, oh, this is right. They feel the same way as I do. Um, so I, I just, I think there's probably a lot of lesbians who are in that situation right now who, were they in a different environment, they wouldn't be acting that way um, or experiencing those feelings, I'm guessing. So the one thing that helped me so much was I meant to... Um, Michigan family reunion in 2017 and there was just so many butch lesbians everywhere they weren't like trying to be masculine or they weren't like trying to be trans men they were just naturally butch and like they weren't like putting thought into it or like it wasn't an act or a costume and I realized like that's just like me I'm just naturally like that and then seeing all of these like lesbians of like different ages seeing that they're like happy and they're okay and everything is fine and also um in that festival there was no males allowed so a lot of the females would walk around without their shirts on and just seeing these lesbians who were so comfortable with their bodies um it had a big impact on me yeah so it helped me a lot like the number one thing i would recommend for somebody who is like struggling to realize if they're a lesbian or not is to like hang out with some lesbians yeah so that's the end of my video um if you have thoughts or questions put them in the comments 
I'm also always on Twitter if you want to strike up a conversation about this. Again, I know that this video will probably offend some people, but I'm just relating like my experiences, my thoughts, my opinions. Um, try not to take it too personally. Okay, bye. In addition to gender identities growing dramatically in number within specific demographics, they are also suspiciously absent from others. For instance, very few middle-aged women transition, not even the autistic or gay ones. Women and girls tend to transition early in life and obviously then get older but they don't typically begin their transition at, for example, 45, like lots of men do. This is because middle-aged women are too old to have the anxieties of working out their place in the world that are faced by teenagers and young adults. A decade ago, if it ever occurred to you that female-to-male -male transsexuals existed, you might have thought of Hilary Swank's portrayal of Tina Brandon, in the 1999 biopic, Boys Don't Cry. Swank's characterization is captivating. Tina Brandon renames herself Brandon Tina, chases girls, swigs beer, and joyrides through rural Nebraska dressed as a boy, and mostly passing as one. Brandon chases a strikingly conservative vision of happiness. What Brandon wants is to find the right girl, win her, marry her, make her happy. You spend the entire movie hoping like hell she'll succeed. The abuse Brandon heroically endures, the knowledge that no one in her place and time is likely to offer the kindness or acceptance Brandon craves, the devastating certainty that this story can only end in tragedy. All of it registers in the viewer's clenched gut. The adolescent girls currently identifying as transgender have almost nothing in common with this picture. They don't want to pass, not really. They typically reject the boy-girl dichotomy that Brand and Tina took for granted. They make little effort to adopt the stereotypical habits of men. They rarely buy a weight set, watch football, or ogle girls. If they cover themselves with tattoos, they prefer feminine ones, flowers or cartoon animals the kind that mark them as something besides stereotypically male. They want to be seen as queer, definitely not as cis men. They flee womanhood like a house on fire, their minds fixed on escape, not on any particular destination. If someone come to the field Negro and said, let's separate, let's run, he didn't say, where are we going? He said, any place is better than here. not on any particular destination. Any place is better than here. Only 12% of natal females who identify as transgender have undergone or even desire phalloplasty. They have no plans to obtain the male appendage that most people would consider a defining feature of manhood. As Sasha Ayad put it to me, a common response that I get from female clients is something along these lines. I don't know exactly that I want to be a guy. I just know I don't want to be a girl. This is because middle-aged women are too old to have the anxieties of working out their place in the world that are faced by teenagers and young adults. So I hated my female body. I hated all female bodies. Anything to do with like female experience of sexuality was like out of my mind and like irrelevant to me. The concept of like lesbians was like always out of my mind it was something i couldn't even think about it was something that was like irrelevant to me um which i recognize now is just denial who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet who taught you to hate your own kind who taught you to hate the sex that you belong to so much so that you don't want to be around each other no before you come asking jk rowling she teach hate you should ask yourself who taught you to hate being what God gave you. This is because middle-aged women are too old to have the anxieties of working out their place in the world that are faced by teenagers and young adults. And at the same time, they are not men and as such don't have male levels of porn consumption. The reason this is relevant is that many prominent so-called trans women 
and or non-binary femme people, i.e. men, especially those who transition in middle age, will attribute their transition to pornography in some way. The video you linked to about puberty blockers by Mia Mulder tries to compare trans identities to left-handedness. There are a bunch of reasons why this comparison is not helpful to the point you want to make. The first is that left-handedness increased across the population uniformly in a way that gender identities did not. For example, left-handedness did not increase dramatically in homosexual and autistic teenagers and then also in old men who watch a lot of porn. Also, this increase took place over nearly half a century. On the other hand, the increases in referrals to gender clinics took place over the period of about seven or eight years. And even then, left-handedness only increased from three to five percent to around 12 percent. This is not just smaller, but many times smaller than the increase in trans identities that has occurred specifically among particular demographics such as teenage girls. What the gender theists have taken the time to ignore is that gender identity and left-handedness had very different starting points in terms of their prevalence in the population during what we are to assume is their socially suppressed periods. When left-handedness was persecuted, 2.5% of the population was still left-handed. This would mean that if you had four classrooms with 25 children each, then statistically just over two of the classes would have a left-handed student. On the other hand, gender dysphoria was much more rare during its comparative period of suppression. Historically, gender dysphoria afflicted 0.1% of the population and almost exclusively boys. That would mean that you would need 40 classrooms of only boys or 80 co-ed classrooms before you would expect to find even one child with gender dysphoria. So, strangely enough, left-handedness, the condition we all agree is innate, was both more prominent in the population even when it was suppressed, but then it also grew much more slowly when it did increase. The growth from about two and a half to between 10 and 12 percent of the population, which is an increase of around 350 percent in terms of prevalence, took 40 years. The explosion of trans identities happened in just seven. There is no way it would even be possible for left-handedness to have experienced a 4,400% increase over seven years because such an increase would have meant that the entire country was left-handed even before the seven years was up. This is why it is apt to say that gender identities are a social contagion. They do not occur uniformly among the population as they would if trans identities were simply an innate human characteristic akin to being left-handed. Funnily enough, in uh, Mia Mulder's video, he actually tells parents, I thought that this would be a video on gray areas. But when it comes to the science, the science is in. But I had to do a lot of research to do that. I had to go through many scientific articles and consult friends and scientists. Ooh. <laughs> who can know how to decipher that. Um, it's very difficult. It's so difficult, in fact, basically every moron with a video camera is doing it. And uh, I do this as my job now, right? I, I, read, I read stuff and I tell you what I've read. I do a book report. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You shouldn't have to do that. And all of that is pretty difficult. But, you know, I enjoyed learning something. And I'm sure that you do too. But you might not want to dig into scientific articles every single week. That can be a bit archaic and difficult. Yeah. This coming from a person who didn't even think to compare the scale and time period 
over which two statistical increases occurred. The only thing that mattered to them was, look, both numbers went up at the end. Who cares how quickly or by how much or where either number was before they started increasing? Two numbers going up means I can win my very own bucket of Lupron. So checkmate, TERFs. So you want to know the truth? Well, this is the truth. Gender is my best friend. Together we can do just about anything. And if you can't handle that, then get a life. If you want to talk about the deep discomfort of the arts, <laughs> dive in. So, um, 